I would right now want to ask our guests to sit at our wonderful round table for the Q&A. And I will also leave the stage to Joyce, one of my colleagues from the class of 17, to conduct this, this discussion, this question and answer session. Thank you. So hello everyone, my name is um, Joyce, I'm also part of the class of um, 17 and have been prepared some questions. Um, so we will start with those, but also we can use some very much as your questions. Um, but first and foremost is our turn. <laughs> um, and we wanted to start with a question to you, Judy, um, as we experience a strong sense of being looked at through the live feed and we would be really interested in the crossover between CCTV and the stage. So we wanted to ask you if you could speak a little more about your interest in theatre and theatrical tools, especially in, in comparison to the live feed system present in the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, um, just I just want to say what how great it was to hear these two presentations and how much they helped me unfold uh, my work some more, and so really appreciate this uh, event. Um, and um, yes, your question about theater, CCTV. Um, I, what was your first bit though? It was something about... Um, Being looked at, right. like through the live feed and how it's sort of the stage and the live feed right. merges. I guess that's a... Sure. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I might not be the best person to answer that. What I think is, uh, where I start with that is just that I find it interesting that in the theater, in this room, we have whatever we have, 60 um, different points of view. Um, like, quite literally. Uh, not just like everybody has a different perspective because you're actually sitting in a different place. And um, with the camera, you are all brought into the single point perspective of the camera. And... Um, that might have something to do with the kind of image power that we feel in a way. Um, I don't quite know how to think about it exactly, but it's like um, I have thought about whether there's a historical moment when you stopped imagining yourself. Uh, I think I think part of, I don't know if it's ego formation, but it's just like something we might do. We might imagine people looking at us at some point. Uh, we might be like, oh, I, I'd love to get up and sing. On some historical moment before there's video and before there's film, I guess you imagine you're standing on a stage, which point you imagine lots of people looking at you, and it could feel good or it could feel bad. Um, but it uh, depends how good you're singing, yes. Depends if it's in a dream where you can't sing, but you have to sing. But, uh, but then um, once we have, I would say, particularly video, um, you imagine, and what we have now is our devices, and I just think in our, in our imaginary horizon, how we imagine ourselves in front of people has changed to sort of imagining ourselves in front of a device or with a device between us and these looking people. So um, I guess CC closed circuit television is one, maybe one way of playing in that realm. Um, um, what I do is not look so much only at people, I really try to look at the space. So somehow it's also, I think, you're looking at the camera, looking at the space, as well as looking at you. So you're having a comparative between your view and the camera's view. And um, the camera's not looking with the logic of surveillance exactly. Sometimes it's just kind of tripped out. It like likes looking at things. Sometimes it floats around. It depends on the installation. So um, um, in that way, that's maybe diff that's quite hard to do in theater if you have like a, sta a proscenium sort of set up. Anyway, I'll stop with those comments. Um, kind of emerging from that question was the following that was addressed to both of you. Um, and how does seeing and being seen you 
How seeing being seen engages in my work? Yeah, your yeah, research. Yeah. My research. Um, uh, with, 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 with regards to theater, not at all. Uh, I, I don't work with theater. Um, I work with performance more as a concept. I was in Bonn uh, in Germany a few uh, months ago talking about performance in relation to video and performing and gender and what does it mean when indeed it doesn't have to be theater to perform. It was about, uh, uh, it's called the video knowledge, like a video art uh, biennale kind of thing. And they were asking me my uh, gendered reading of uh, performing. Uh, so it seems to me that to do with performance, but also to do with this idea of looking, being looked, it kind of pops up all the time. Uh, my specific research, I actually work on documentary films, go figure, um, which actually has a lot to, to, to in, co in common with what we were discussing today and questions of imaginary reality, image, perception and all of that. So just, I, I feel like the way of uh, looking and being looked at is something that I work in my research. Uh, it's just one of the concepts a little bit like was talked about before, the, tec the technologies of seeing, the technologies of looking is what I find a red thread through so many uh, engagements with work. And maybe last thing, um, as teachers, and I think both of us are, there is another aspect of looking and being looked at, uh, like being on stage here and, and teaching. It's a whole different level, which it luckily I never think about when I teach, otherwise I would go completely nuts. When I'm teaching about looking and practices of looking, if I were to also be concerned with how I'm being looked at in the moment that I'm performing on the stage of teaching, that would be a whole different thing. But I would say that that has to do with my practice as well, because that takes about um, more than 50% uh, of my time to be looked at in the moment I'm talking about looking <laughs> to other people who are looking at me. <laughs> Yeah, I can uh, say that uh, this relationship has always been important for me because my approach to bodies is precisely that they're always relational. It's like there's no body without another body um, existing. So this relationship between see being seen and seeing, of course, is formative of everybody's body um, or sense of embodiment. Um, at the same time, what I've recently um, uh, realized uh, which is something that was quite shocking to me as a theorist who's been working with these themes for so many years, is that uh, when we approach that relationship between seeing and being seen through the notion of disability, we get to a whole different world. And, uh, and that is that world where seeing cannot be taken for granted anymore, and that a certain type of seeing or seeing certain types of bodies is actually creating a certain wound um, in the seeing of other people. So that relationship between seeing and being seen becomes something that uh, is not only uh, dramatic, so almost theatrical, um, uh, but that uh, opens up a whole new set of possibilities if we uh, allow ourselves to become aware of it. So, so I'm very interested in that uh, kind of seeing through blindness in, in the sense of seeing the blind spots of seeing, um, the limits of seeing. Do you want to respond to that or shall I ask the audience if they have a, a question? Yeah, anyone? There is a wireless mic. Hello, um, thank you all for the event um, and all of the fantastic things quite clearly. Um, I was actually wondering, it came up um, a little bit more in Jules' talk and uh, in the discussion between Julie and Daniel, the selflessness um, and the, pos the, the, the possible political power. Um, the show in itself deals a lot with physical, like doors, windows, frames. Um, and I was wondering, do you think that this type of perhaps non-human entities could actually exercise political control? I dare. Um, I'll take maybe a detour in responding that and picking up on what you pointed out as, you know, in that setup of as a teacher, 
looking and being looked at is is already always there and of course we as a as an art space we i mean we didn't build this building but the building is there so there is something to look at and so that people have a place to go to look at something so again it's really very much ingrained in what we do and we do many different things and you might enjoy looking at some things, you might not enjoy looking at other things, but that is always what is happening here. And in that sense, um, to me, that touches also upon the social, hence also the political aspect of being a space for looking and being a public space, very importantly, for looking. We are not a private institution. We are um, as accessible as we can. We probably fail many times in being as accessible as we should be we you know it's a constant claim or a constant <coughs> fight to be public and I think what that fight is there because it's a responsibility of being public and we have a responsibility to create a space where things can be looked at in a certain way and people can look at things in a certain way and we are much cowards in this because we ask artists to do that for us but at least our you know we are facilitators for that wonderful undertaking that artists do um, in that sense everything that happens here is has that political potential um, I think it's a very different thing whether it always has to be or whether it always succeeds to be or when you try to be maybe it's not and when you're not trying to be maybe it is um, I think that is very much what to touch on or, or refer to what's been talked about already as well, very much an embodied um, stance or opinion that will differ as yeah, 60 points of view on, on, on that as well. Um, yeah, that's all I dare to say about that. Um, but, but your question was also about uh, could these so-called cultural techniques of like doors and windows, but you also mean cameras, I think. Could, could they be um, like systems of control or something? Yeah, for sure. I mean, mostly, I guess they are. You know, the wall is, the gate is, and, and almost uh, the chair is, and the organization of the room is. And so, yes, for sure. Um, um, but power is also, power and control are kind of part of our, um, you know, our tissues. So um, that doesn't mean they're good or they're bad. This is sort of just something that we negotiate al all the time, and they can obviously have very negative consequences. But I'm quite interested in how much I feel like, in <coughs> and we had a great session today, which we started with ray diagrams about the mirror and how to sort of calculate like where something is in a mirror and how big a mirror you need. So it was like really trying to use the mirror as, uh, as whether it was or wasn't a cultural technique this morning. I wasn't sure according to the definition <coughs> of cultural technique because it's supposed to create a difference and did it really, cultural techniques tend to create uh, something different from something else and did it work? And anyway, so, um, so, um, I mean, we've mostly also heard how the, m the mirror could be a kind of, uh, depending on, uh, dep I don't want to, I don't want to reduce it to depending on how you use it, but it could be, a c a c depending on your relationship to it or our relationship to it, could be a system of control. But I feel like your, you guys who are looking at this exhibition, you quite felt quite, um, s a hot feeling from the cameras, like a hot, a hot embarrassment, and um, and I'm I can totally recognize it, and I don't want to pretend that I don't understand why that would be there, um, but it's not the primary thing for me. But I, I think it's really interesting how you're talking about it. And maybe I should just push it further because I think I've been like trying to not maybe as a young artist in the 80s, like that metaphor of surveillance was you almost couldn't do a video without some, you couldn't just like have a, do anything, and everyone's like surveillance, surveillance. So I probably was like, okay, I'm gonna stay away from this, because it's not exactly surveillance anymore. I think we're not, th we're trying to think of it, of course, more e d differently. We know that there's surveillance, but, Anyway, I'm quite interested, and I, I'd actually be interested to hear you guys say uh, what this hot, embarrassed, disturbed, potential feeling was. 
of being looked of being looked at. I mean, it's a sort of assumption that there's um, that there's a hostility um, built into being to to being seen. Maybe I think it was more had more to do with the confrontation and not knowing to be. Seen. Yeah, and and the and the fact that the camera um, it's not following you exactly, but it's catching glimpses of you, which. Um, you talked about not being recognizable in, in some images or some photographs that are sometimes taken of you, but this was always like you caught yourself off guard whilst you were there, right. um, which made us think about who, what it, what it means to be, to, to see yourself without actually seeing yourself, or what does it mean to see yourself in a very unexpected way? Um, I think that was sort of the, the, the way in rather than a very hostile environment. More yeah. I just also, I mean, I'm only processing all these things now, so then it's also like, I'm also interested to see if in future works, how could I, or could I, or does it, I think it happens all the time in cinema and other people's artwork. It's like, could you kind of look lovingly? But without the, like we have a temporality uh, of our looks, which are like, you can look at babies for a long time, babies could look at you for like up to some age, maybe the mirror stage. You can look and you, it's okay, and there's not too anx anxious. And then after that, it all gets very haywire, at least in, I think, in the culture that I've grown up in. Um, and, but the camera doesn't always do that. And so I'm kind of interested in, uh, whether we can, because I actually love looking at people and they look so fantastic, it's so nice to look at other people and there they are and they don't necessarily, they're not, they're not composing themselves for their selfie and they're not, n they may be not composing themselves, maybe they don't care if you're looking at them or not or they don't know, but sometimes it's just so lovely and they are kind of just this generic human thing and we read a bit of this Janae text this morning about kind of him thinking everybody's the same stuff. So I have that as a slightly utopian idea about it. I was thinking maybe also in what, what you described as what you gathered from the, from the group, um, could it be that it seems, it's, it gets a hot tension, uh, which I like as a description, it gets hot because the camera is there, you are being seen, but the camera does not care about you. It's an indifferent camera, because it's busy, as you described, it's busy looking at a lot of things, but it doesn't care about you as a visitor. It's not there to see you. You happen to disturb almost this camera enjoying looking at all the beautiful things Judy placed in the space. Could it be that that's where the unheimliche feeling comes from? Um, because we're used to cameras also in CCTV, they're there, they're for us, right? They're there to see us either lovingly if it's a selfie, you know, suspiciously if it's a surveillance camera. I think Judy creates cameras in a way that they are, not, I wouldn't say they're indifferent as such, but they are maybe indifferent to you in terms of what you're doing. Um, and maybe that's don't a strange encounter today. Turn yeah, don't touch the page turn initiative. <laughs> Well, it, it could be. And I was also, whilst you were talking, thinking about the fact that in this current day and age, we're so used to mediating our own image and the camera being there specifically for you, and that's not the case in the exhibition, I, I believe. Um, but this actually also brings us a little bit back to one of the questions we had. Could, could I briefly, yeah. one thing I wanted to respond to the questions if windows and, and mirrors um, could become political yeah, could become political, and there's a, I don't know the artist, unfortunately, but with the internet we can figure it out um, all together. Um, there was an exhibition that the late Jan Hoot once made in Hale, which is a small place in Belgium where I happen to be from, um, and there's a big psychiatrical hospital there, and when you're in Hale, you encounter a lot of, um, what in what you refer to, that kind of photography would be aberrant, human beings, but in Inhale you have this beautiful system where they are placed in families, so they don't live in the asylum, they are placed in families who take care of them and, you know, give them a position in society that allows them to be aberrant. Um, and so, anyway, Jan Hoot did a big exhibition there and they have this beautiful psychiatrical old hospital building and an art one artist um, intervened and they have these beautiful big windows, it's not unlike Ritterwit, but a bit like one scale up even. 
and this artist placed just huge panes of mirror in the glass, in, in the window frames. So when you look at the facade, all you see are these huge mirrors. And of course, it's a pretty one-on-one -on -one symbolics, maybe like, oh, we're all crazy, right? That's, that's the cheapest reading of that work. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting work to refer to here briefly as an intervention with mirrors, with windows, that becomes socially charged, let's say. Can I just say? Yeah, yeah can I? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know if I could add anything uh, or much to what has already been said, but I, I, I do think I very much agree that uh, that uh, maybe windows and doors themselves are not political, uh, but uh, if we uh, relate to them in a specific way, namely in a way which becomes aware of the ways they are being used, and maybe also um, you know like used in politics in the sense of you know like especially, well, again, referring to disability uh, discourse, uh, doors can keep out people. And if they're used in a society in ways that want to keep out people, or walls, as you said, uh, then I think they become political. But then not just by themselves, um, but always within that particular discourse. Also, of course, there is this uh, dimension of material agency, which I think is also quite interesting. It's a form of agency that is ascribed to matter itself, which is never independent of the relation it has to the rest of the world and other matter, but that has a, almost an agency in itself. And I think maybe part of that agency is what I'm <coughs> describing when I use the concept of the mirror, is that there is something in the mirror that is not only um, cultural or political or related to seeing, but it is also, for example, sensual. That there's also something that is a very specific relationship um, to that particular material in its relationship to the body, which we could translate at some point into a political project. But yeah. So sorry, do you want to respond to that? Be right back. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to. Um, talk a little bit about identity because it came up during all of your talks in one way or another. Um, and do you feel like it over your, your um, you used tools that overlap um, with you um, reference to framing interactions and environment between all of you? Um, that might be a bit too much to ask. <laughs> um, do you feel an overlap in the tools you use between all of you? I'm going to go first because it's an easy answer for me at least. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was positively surprised, which I think this speaks of how well you uh, indeed arranged this, this, this event, because I do feel that some concepts keep coming around, some framing in the sense of how we think or how we see. I see a lot of connection, and having met the three of you for the first time ever today is quite surprising, which I think is interesting in terms of what kind of intervention some of us are doing from our different disciplines or, or fields that somehow seem to go in a similar direction. So it's like you hit the nail on the head in, in, in bringing this topic, I think, on the fore and, and this exhibition right now and all of that. So I don't know if I would say that identity is the thing that brings us together or in the, f in the, in the way that we've been discussing it, but definitely a certain way of thinking of um, spaces and bodies and, 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 and the visuality of it or the invisibility, the visible invisibility business uh, is, is one of the connecting points between this idea of bodies and space. And I think we have all of this in common in our work and then each of us will do it in a different way. So I definitely see a lot of resonances. I wouldn't say that identity would be the thing that comes to mind in, in our connections. That is maybe more of a spin-off of how we could bring them. And maybe if we were to define it, G don't ask us to do that, please. <laughs> if you were to ask <laughs> the four of us to define what we mean with identity, we probably would have different answers to that, so really don't. Uh, <laughs> but I think there is that, that there can be a spin-off of the work. I wouldn't say that that's the common element, but definitely. Well, uh, uh, what I see as the common element is uh, the the kind of, you know, what you uh, said, what you both said is that making strange of something. So that um, moment of insecurity, of stumbling over something that we usually used to do or that comes easy to us. And then 
and then recognizing that in that stumbling um, or making strange or feeling strange or uh, doing something differently uh, that something happens there and I think all of our work is somehow located there and even when it comes to identity I think it's, it's that kind of questioning what what are we talking about? <laughs> or what are we when we think about identity in the first place? So it's like making strange even of the concept of identity. Yeah. Well, identity is something that I, I think it's like the sun. It's best not looked at directly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think is why it's interesting also to talk about media. And it's because it's a mediating. It's something in the middle. It's something where... You know, it's again the mirror. You look in it, and something comes out, and that's what you can talk about. But identity, as such, is not what happens in a mirror. Um, so yeah, no, I know. I yeah, I agree. I don't think identity is is per se at the crux of things. It's something that I am very, very reluctant to talk about, and especially if you want to talk politics. We see it all over the world. If politicians start talking identity, things will get bad, because it's not something that you can talk about in that one. That yeah, one directional way. Identity is something that exactly it happens here and there, you know. Thank God it does. It's a beautiful thing, like the sun. But don't look at it. Don't try to go at it directly and put a you know put a box on it, because then then it's never a healthy thing. I think that's interesting. Just that, uh, that we. S I mean, it's just something I was struggling with in terms of your your suggested topic, and I just thought, well, that's going to be interesting. Um, but it is, and it truly was interesting because it b b brought me back to to trying to think about it, but also this metaphor with the mirror and realizing that the mirror is you know you seeing yourself where you are not, basically in a certain way, and that that is. Uh, um, um, in one way, you can just embrace that as, as like also an aspect of identity formation. And I think that that, that complexity is really an important part of like, um, I guess when I went to school and like, in, and I still holding on a little bit to, although I'm also trying to understand, you know, object-oriented ontologies and speculative realism. And, and I understand there's critiques of all our phenomenological ways of thinking. and. But still, uh, you know, in this sort of uh, cr cr critical theory, you would say that you you, you would critique identity identity thinking as thinking that the that the object and the concept are are the same thing, uh, that they are they're they're they're, they're melded together, and that's where I and I still sort of feel that that's a violence in a way to think that the idea and the thing uh, are the same, and that it. I think that it doesn't have to mean that we are, um, co you know, in a correlationism where we can't experience reality necessarily, but that this gap that you're also talking about, and I think particularly for art, it always seems like a place to work, this kind of gap between the, th the concept and the thing, to, to put it in one language. still has a question. Yes, in the back. And I think that's also the, the last question for tonight. Hi, hi. Um, I was I was thinking in uh, in terms of like in light of uh, the body as an object as uh, Jules was just talking about and spe specifically in relation to your work um, when you employ things as mirrors and uh, and CCTV, which is uh, supposed to be like, uh, they just show what is there and they do it <coughs> like in a non-targeted, as uh, someone said, like in different way. So there's a kind of like uh, ob objectivation happening of uh, the surroundings and, and also of uh, bodies and fragments of bodies. And I was um, wondering like uh, how important to use this like aspect of realism, uh, kind of like this kind of like realism in your work and uh, and how does that also like, how does that like, as being opposed to um, the imaginary body or um, or something, some notion like the false or like how, what is your view on that? What is the notion like the false? Like some, something like, uh, like something that is false okay. or like something that is like not real or. I don't think I have a good answer. Um, that was a nice description. Um, <coughs> 
I think I haven't quite thought of the work in those terms. Um, I guess I just see this doubling, which like, and so there's a lot of doubling all the time, like these mirrors that aren't really mirrors. Do you know why I think those, some of it's humor, like I think it's, there's a, like I do think there's an absurdity to uh, the way our brain, say, completes that mirror into a thing that's a mirror, but it's not even, it's like a really cheap attempt, like I always make sure there's a lot of different things on either side, but you almost can't help it that you want it to be a mirror. So I guess that's also in thinking about some of the things Jules was talking about, like you then you can feel the perception, so maybe creating reality or the document or, so I guess there needs to be a certain level of that plain and simple what's there, like maybe that's why I'm attracted to that, so that it can be there. Then revealing our perception of it in the moment seems more p possible than if you create a, like a, a very complex cinematographic uh, illusion it seems uh, not, uh, yeah, I couldn't, I, I haven't yet cracked how you'd, how you'd pop open the, the percept, like the person perceiving themselves watching, watching that because um, it's already so constructed. Thank you. I don't, <coughs> I don't think that this would answer your question actually, but just to think further, I think this is something we didn't talk about enough, so more for, for future thinking, but this relation between the realism or it being false, and I think it connects with what you said earlier, the concept of the thing and, and the, the, the reality and the fiction, this is something that is, I, I also felt it or, or thought about it through uh, crossing the exhibition, and I think there are many ways, there are scholars who've been thinking very much at actually deconstructing both of these ideas, where does reality or realism starts and how realism is actually to produce a realistic effect you need a lot of fictional elements to create that realistic effect that's what you do in documentaries to be realistic you actually have to use a lot of fictional techniques so one of the interventions that some scholars are doing is very much to to question not to indeed not to be like oh we can't know reality and we are all lost in a world of images but like to really see the complexities of where one uh, ends and the other one starts in terms of uh, yeah, what is to be considered factual or fictional, and I think with relation especially to, to the cameras and the idea that cameras that don't have a human behind it, like let's call them CCTV cameras or these automatic cameras, that somehow uh, it's very much, and it's a cultural technique of thinking that cameras, if they don't have a person behind it, they are more objective, they are more looking at reality as it unfolds in front of them than if I were to be behind that camera right now moving it around through my own will, right? So there is also a way of thinking that cameras on their own, they're not necessarily uh, more realistic or more objective than if there is a person behind it. There is already a mediation that is the, the, the techniques of looking, the meanings we attach to what is a camera, framing, la la, that doesn't necessarily speak of truthfulness or, or reality because there is a fictionality or uh, a subjectivity already at play. So I think it makes it more difficult rather than answering the question, but to think a bit more mm, beyond uh, a very clear cut of where the fiction and the reality um, are. If I may, one thing I do remember as we were making the exhibition at one point, Judy, you were like, but I don't want something domestic. So I think in that sense also <laughs> creating, uh, you know, there's a lot of art out there that plays on the staging of the domestic, meaning the real, in a false way in the exhibition space, heightening that tension between what we know as our lived world and the artificiality of the exhibition space. And I think precisely the fact that um, Judy in this exhibition avoided that kind of, you know, yeah, recreation of a domestic space that allows you to escape the binary of truth and false and exactly hi highlights the fact that it's about the process of looking at things even, it's of course the whole thing is artificial but the whole thing is also completely true. You know, and this is also again with the live cameras, there's no recording, there's nothing pre-recorded, there's no fake image, there's no fake news in this show, it's, re it's all facts. <laughs> you know, in that sense it's quite dry, you know, it's all, it is what it is. 
Um, so I think it's it's more productive, and I, I really like in that sense also to have create an effect of 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 reality. It's often best to go some with a completely artificial route to end up in a situation that actually feels very natural. Can I just add like one very short thing? I uh, how I approach this problem of reality uh, in my work is always that I don't want to get at what reality is, but how it is experienced. And I think when we walk through the exhibition of Judy, then everyone will have a different experience. And if we can, if the exhibition allows the viewer or the visitor to experience what is seen as a form of reality, no matter how it is created, <laughs> I think then a lot, of, a lot has been already created in terms of reality. I like moving further to the front. If there are more questions, can ask them. So shoot, if you're ready to go there and now, this is your moment. The hot question. The hot question. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, thanks so much 